the One Piece manga just confirmed one of the most game-changing theories about Luffy's father because, ladies and gentlemen, Monkey D. Dragon, yes, was a marine. That's right. Which means that we simply must ask all sorts of questions such as why did he join? What rank was he? Did he already have his devil fruit? What made him hate the world nobles so much that he eventually declared war on the entire Celestial Dragons? How did he become the most wanted man in the world? Like man, there's so much to talk about, but thankfully the chapter does give us a reason why he left, which is that he realized that there was no real justice in the Marines, but come on. I mean, let's be real, there has to be some truly tragic or horrifyingly awful event that actually sparked his desire to Leave. And honestly, by looking at his entire timeline so far, I do think that we can actually figure out what that super important event might have been. But before we get ahead of ourselves here though, let's start at the beginning here on this handy timeline because to really understand Dragon's motivations, we do need to understand exactly where he has been. And it actually all starts when Dragon was born 55 years before the current storyline, and we're gonna assume that Vice Admiral Garp, so Luffy's grandfather, is actually his father, even though that's never actually been confirmed officially. In fact, Garp only ever said that Dragon was Luffy's father, not that Dragon was necessarily his son. So there is definitely room to speculate that Garp is not even Dragon's father, but for now, let's assume that he is Garp's son. And it makes a ton of sense that Garp would want Dragon to also join the Marines, just like he later wanted Luffy to. Only that other than Luffy, this time it seems that Dragon actually listened to Garp instead of immediately rebelling like Luffy did. And I'm sure that Garp was absolutely thrilled that his son was following in his footsteps, but I also don't think that Dragon joined just because of Garp. Because I mean, one thing that he clearly has is a strong sense of justice that he has continued to believe in even after leaving the Marines. So there must have been some sort of other inner motivation for Dragon to actually join the Marines in the first place. And now while we don't actually know precisely when he joined, I do think it's fairly reasonable to assume that it was sometime as a late teenager or maybe in his early 20s, which just happens to line up perfectly with the God Valley incident. Actually, more specifically, Dragon was 17 years old during the events on God Valley, so maybe he did join up soon after that enormous battle took place. Now, what exactly could have happened during his times in the Marines? Well, we don't really know for sure, of course, but he simply must have risen high enough in the ranks to realize that there is no real justice in there, because he probably isn't finding out something a life-changing like that as just a regular marine or an even lower ranking officer. And so I think one would have to imagine that he became pretty high ranked within the marines, probably at least a vice admiral, if not even an admiral itself, since these are the marines who actually do get tasked with a lot of the marines and the celestial dragons dirty work. And let me be real here, I would just love to see Marine Admiral Dragon doing something truly amazing. Plus, Dragon does have this whole green color scheme going on with his robe and clothing and the wind power, so he would fit right into the Admiral color themes. And in fact, he might have been the first Admiral Green Bull, or Green Dragon, I guess. However, after joining the Marines, the next actual confirmed sighting of Dragon in the story is this scene right here, which was 16 years after the events of God Valley, when Dragon was 33 years old. Now, at this point, he has already left the Marines and formed the so-called Freedom Fighters, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. There's a lot more about that in this chapter. However, when I read this scene, it does seem like the Freedom Fighters have not been around for all that long here, so I would imagine that Dragon was a Marine until at least in his late 20s, so maybe about five years or so before this scene with Vegapunk here. But even more importantly, this scene gives us our most concrete clue about why Dragon may have have grown to hate the Celestial Dragons and eventually decided to leave the Marines. Before I speculate about that though, let's first explain why some other common theories for Dragon hating the world nobles are probably not true anymore at this point. For example, one of the most common theories why Dragon might hate the world nobles was that they killed Luffy's mother, but after this chapter, we can pretty much cross out that idea mostly because if you look up when Luffy was born, Dragon was already 36 years old, which was definitely 
way after he left the Marines. In other words, that means Luffy was actually born after Dragon had already founded the Revolutionary Army, which actually brings back the idea that Ginny might be Luffy's mom, not Bonnie's, but hey, more on that in just a moment as well. But first, another common idea for Dragon hating the world nobles was the idea that he learned about the world secret ruler, Emu. However, that was basically already proven to be false back in chapter 1086, and that's because when Sabo explained that Emu is the secret ruler of the world to Dragon and Ivankov, there was absolutely no hint whatsoever that Dragon already knew anything about this information, which of course it is possible that he was hiding the info and pretending not to know it, but I think it's pretty unlikely at this point, so that's probably also not the reasons that he left the Marines. Which basically only leaves us with about two or three very decent other reasons that I can see for Dragon deciding to leave. The first is that the world nobles didn't actually kill Luffy's mom, but instead they killed Dragon's mom. Which I mean, if we're going with the idea that Garp is his actual father, then that could mean that they killed Garp's wife. Which again, seems kind of unlikely because I do feel an event like that would even send someone like Garp on a rampage to wipe out all of the world nobles himself. But of course, if Dragon isn't Garp's son, then we have a whole different situation here, but I still think it's kind of unlikely. And so maybe the most likely option at the moment based on the timeline that we've built and the events from chapter 1066 is that at some point Dragon met the scholars of Ohara and learned some of the true history of the world. Don't believe me? Well, during his meeting with Vegapunk, Dragon revealed that he already knew Professor Clover, who was the leader of the scholars and was desperately searching for information about the Void Century. In fact, we're being told in that very same chapter that Clover was arrested by the Marines at least 10 times. So wouldn't it just make a lot of sense if Dragon was the actual one who chased after Clover while he was a Marine? You know, kind of like Smoka is chasing Luffy. And if that was the case, I can easily imagine that Dragon would become friends with this adventure scholar and even learn some of the dark secrets about the world government that Clover discovered on his journeys. Because I mean, that same Marine and Pirate dynamic is also what happened to Garb and the former Pirate King Goldie Roger, where Garb chased after Roger for years and they eventually became somewhat like friends, I guess. But on top of all of this, Dragon could have also met Nico Olvia, who was also one of the scholars of Ohara and Robin's mother. Okay, no, we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. But in fact, in chapter 593, we actually learned that the Revolutionary Army and Dragon have been searching for Robin for over 10 years, and they even call her the Light of the Revolution, which is just even more evidence that Dragon had a very important relationship with Clover or Olivia in the past, and it fits together very nicely that this relationship, plus maybe some other tragic event in his past, in the end sparked Dragon's desire to defeat the Celestial Dragons. Or one more bonus option maybe is that Dragon met Roger at some point and learned the true history of the world from him. Now this is possible because Roger did find Love Tale about three years before Dragon met with Vegapunk on Ohara, so I'm just saying the timing and the timelines do line up pretty well here. Plus, I've actually always been super curious how Dragon out of all these crazy people that we know earned the highest bounty in the entire world. And what we don't find out in this chapter, we do know that the one thing that the world government absolutely does not allow is research into the Poneglyphs. Plus, I've actually always been super curious how Dragon out of all these crazy people that we know earned the highest bounty in the entire world. And what we don't find out in this chapter, we do know that the one thing that the world government absolutely does not allow is research into the Poneglyphs. And so if Dragon was friends with the people who did the research of the Poneglyphs, or he got some info about them from Roger, and all of that, plus the fact that he's making an entire army to fight the world nobles and is a former marine, could be enough reasons for him to be, have that super high bounty and be the most wanted man in the entire world. But in the end, whichever of these reasons actually sparked Dragon's decision to leave the Marines, it's not quite as important as what happens next. Because as we learned from chapter 1066 and this chapter, Dragon had already formed the group known as the Freedom Fighters, which is essentially Dragon's group of rebels before he officially founded the Revolutionary Army. And so in chapter 1097, we find 
finally get to see these freedom fighters in action. And that's because about 16 years after Kuma and Ginny started living on the island, the ruler of the Sorbet Kingdom basically segregated the entire island into a section protected by the kingdom and a section that is just basically lawless land. Not only that, but on top of that, there was also a massive tax placed on the people to pay for the world government's heavenly tribute. Now, this whole storyline might finally explain how Kuma got his reputation as the Tyrant King, because even though he's basically a priest for these people, I can honestly see the young Kuma rising up to become sort of the boss or king of this lawless land, which obviously the upper class of this kingdom wouldn't want to see at all, and he is put into jail. But soon after that, Dragon and Ivankov here arrived with their band of freedom fighters to overthrow this corrupt ruler, which finally leads to Kuma and Ginny joining up with the freedom fighters, which then officially at this point become the revolutionary army. But from here on out though, there are actually a few new important points that we can actually add to our timeline. For example, in this chapter, we learned that 14 years ago, Kuma and Ginny were confirmed to both still be a part of the revolutionaries. At this point in time, Kuma is 33 years old and Ginny is 37. And this fact by itself is actually super interesting. First of all, again, props to Ginny for surviving this long in the story. I mean, I honestly thought that she wouldn't even make it off God Valley. But the second really interesting point this brings up is that we once again have to reanalyze the question of is Ginny someone's mom? I mean, after last chapter, it did seem pretty logical that since she and Kuma were living together, then Ginny would eventually become Bonnie's mother, right? And I'd still say that it might be one of the most likely options since Ginny already wanted to marry Kuma in this same chapter. And really, I mean, there's just so many similarities between their name, their personalities, but wait until you hear the insane theory coming up in just a moment. But before that though, another option is Ginny being Luffy's mom, which after last chapter, I thought that wouldn't be the case. But now that she has been fully with the revolutionaries for such a long time, I mean, honestly, anything could happen between Ginny and Kuma or Ginny and Dragon, which, okay, would be kind of a weird love triangle to even think about. So let's just go on to the next option. Because then there is, of course, the possibility that Bonnie might be Ginny's clone. But now that we've learned at the end of this chapter that Ginny has been kidnapped, I'm kind of starting to think that there might be another mind-blowing new possibility that we hadn't even considered so far. Because even though we don't know exactly when on on the timeline that Ginny was kidnapped, we can reasonably guess that it was sometime around 14 years before the current story. And so whenever this occurred, it gives us the perfect setup for Kuma to become a warlord and a government slave. Because if Ginny was captured by the world government, then of course Kuma is going to try and save her. Maybe they wanted Ginny for some sort of devil fruit power or some other reason, but for now that reason isn't that important. Honestly, I keep saying I've been surprised that Ginny has has been alive for this long, but what if that is because she was never actually dead in the first place? Because yeah, that's right. I'm proposing that Bonnie that we have known for most of the story now is in fact Ginny who was aged down and had her memories pushed out by Kuma. Which at first sounds crazy, yeah I know, and while she doesn't look exactly like Bonnie in this chapter, her appearance really isn't that far off. Plus, if you look deep enough, there is actually some pretty solid evidence that supports this exact idea. First of all, we do know that the world government wanted Bonnie for some reason, and it does appear that they had once captured her. Which honestly does seem pretty weird, knowing that she's basically a pirate and we always saw her as a young one at that. But what if they had actually captured her as Ginny, and then they later let her go in exchange for Kuma becoming the world government slave? But on top of that, if you look back to chapter 1074, and the memories that Bonnie viewed in the lab, there are some very odd circumstances surrounding this as well. First of all, Vegapunk was desperate for Bonnie not to see those memories, which was always a little bit weird to me. I mean, yeah, her father's memories might have just been painful, but wouldn't it be good for Bonnie to see what her father went through? Unless, of course, these actually weren't Kuma 
Grandma's memories, but they were instead Ginny's memories, and Vegapunk didn't want her to realize that Bonnie isn't who she thinks she actually is. Also, in this flashback that we thought was Kuma's, Bonnie is looking at Kuma from the outside, which wouldn't really make sense if they were Kuma's memories in the first place. Because if these were Kuma's memories, shouldn't the memories actually show a perspective through his eyes? Instead, we kind of see it as if from someone else's perspective, looking at Kuma, which would make a lot more sense if these were Ginny's memories instead. Plus, we were also literally shown Bonnie turning Vegapunk into a baby right before she touched the memories, which seems like the sort of foreshadowing that Oda would love to do. However, the one piece of evidence that fits this theory altogether is this panel from chapter 908. So, in case you don't remember this, this scene had Bonnie trying to sneak into Marijua in order to save Kuma. But going back and looking at it now, I just have to wonder, how did she even know who this Connie person was and that they were the queen of Kuma's homelands? Unless, of course, she actually once lived there and had memories of this person, just like Ginny did. Plus, there's of course the question of how she even looks enough like this Connie person to fool the guards, but I don't have any answer for that unless Ginny was a descendant of that ruling family or something like that, which doesn't seem like the case from this last chapter. But yeah, Ginny might be a mother, but she also might very well be still alive as Bonnie, and we just never knew about it. But even more so, with all of this talk of Dragon, the Marines, and the Revolutionaries, I do really wonder if Dragon's story of being a Marine and later leaving will be the model for another Marine to flip sides in the future as well. I mean, a really easy choice for this would be Kobe, but honestly, I see him more as following into Garb's footsteps than Dragon's. I mean, Kobe literally dreams of being a Marine Admiral, and he trained under Garb. Plus, Garb basically gave up his life to save Kobe, so yeah, I do see Kobe as trying to get rid of the corruption from within the Marines rather than from the outside, which means that the perfect candidate is actually Vice Admiral Smoker here. I mean, if you look at his entire character arc, which has just led him to uncovering more and more of the government's corruption, then it would just make sense that eventually he wouldn't be able to take any more of it, and he will choose to leave the Marines by himself. Himself. And at this point, I just wonder what event might actually tip him over the edge and make him possibly even become a pirate or join the revolutionaries. But what's even more exciting though is that the flashback isn't even over yet, so in the next few chapters we might even get to see Dragon fully show off his powers for the very first time and, well, this is like one of those mysteries that I've been desperate to know about for so long because he just has to be, right? One of the top tier powerhouses in the entire story. And if you want to know what his legendary powers might actually be, plus the unknown powers of other extremely strong fighters in the story, then you can check out this video right here. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.